What's going on guys? It's Adam from Spiritus Systems. And today we're gonna to be talking about sleep in a semi-permissive environment. If you don't know what we're talking about, just go check out the first video in this series, which is sleep in a non-permissive environment. While you're watching that, I'm gonna catch some more Zs. Wake me up when you're done. Hey, welcome back guys. It's Adam from Spiritus Systems. Today we're gonna to be talking about sleep in a semi-permissive environment. This is video two in a three-part video series we're doing on sleep. It's part of our Patrol Basics videos. If you haven't checked those videos out, go back, watch them. We have video one, which is about sleep in a non-permissive environment. So if you wanna get caught up there, check that one out first and then watch this video. So semi-permissive environments. What do we mean? I think it's important that we frame what that is and what we're talking about when we say semi-permissive. Semi-permissive is a transitional zone between a non-permissive environment and a permissive environment. Permissive is what we all live in today. So you can go to bed when you want, you can sleep in whatever you want, you can you know use whatever kind of bedding you want. Contrasted, a non-permissive environment is none of that. You don't get to choose when you sleep, where you sleep, and what items you might be able to use to sleep. The army, is a nomadic animal. It is constantly moving, it is constantly changing where it's putting its footprint, and the soldiers that are caught up in that movement have to be adaptable to whatever conditions the army is putting them in. That could be guys just traveling over into a theater and they're getting placed into a semi-permissive environment, somewhere that they're not familiar with, somewhere where they don't have quarters to sleep in, and there still might be an element of danger there that they have to deal with, right? So they can't just be completely relaxed uh, because of the environment. In theater, it can mean guys are at an OP site for an extended period of time. And these OP sites tend to be well-guarded, well-supplied, and they're in defensible positions where you are not afraid of the enemy being able to just come right up against you without you first responding to that threat. So it gives you the ability to uh, you know, bust out some additional tools for sleeping. Uh, it could also be guys that are just behind the line who are in a refit kind of status, which is, is something that this generation hasn't had to deal with as much because the type of warfare we've been conducting has been very asymmetrical, but we're starting to see with what's going on in Europe uh, that you know this trench warfare is starting to happen again and those troops have to be rotated out, but they're not always being rotated out into a permissive environment they're oftentimes being rotated back into a semi-permissive environment where they maybe don't have accommodation uh, provided for them and there still could be the threat of attack even in those rearward positions. Semi-permissive environments to what we're talking about, we have a ton of different examples we're gonna show you, some core examples and then some kind of outliers. And uh, we think we're gonna give you a really good view of the tools that you can use to help you succeed in a semi-permissive environment. So I wanted to start off with talking about my core items and if you're here looking for stuff to buy or, or answers to the test then you're going to want to check these four items out for sure uh, these are items that are issued in one form or another so it may not be the one that you see here but but it is an issued item i think every soldier should have these in his rucksack pretty much all the time. There are obviously environments that are gonna be a lot warmer where you'll take some of the items out and there's gonna be environments that are a lot colder where you're gonna to have to add items to the list or change them out as well. But these four items can pretty much take a guy almost anywhere in the world uh, and he can set up shop and survive out of them. The first item I'm gonna talk about is the bivy sack. So right here I have a issued Marine Corps bivy sack. Uh, it's made out of Gore-Tex Pro. I think that it's actually a better bivy sack than what the Army issues in the Equix system, which is, it's like a multi-cam or a woodland or an Army combat uniform ACU pattern uh, bivy. The reason why I think it's better is one, it's made out of a, a more lightweight material and it has a internal flexible stay with a mosquito netting on your face. Uh, one of the big problems with any bivy sack is that when you completely contain yourself, you're gonna be breathing into that bag all night and that condensation is gonna build up. So you end up having to you know, take that flap off and then now you have insects coming in and biting the ever living hell out of you all night. So 
uh, this solves that problem. It's very nice to be able to open that internal uh, rain flap and allow some, some air to get in. It is a little bit more narrow than some of the other bivy sack options out there, uh, which means that putting your sleep pad on the inside of the bivy sack, which is a technique that I generally would use, may not be possible with this particular bivy sack. All of these items, the core items, they are used in conjunction with the other items most of the time. Uh, even if you have your poncho, it's nice to actually be inside of a uh, waterproof barrier as well. So that, you know, water that might be, you know, sideways rain coming in or water running through. Uh, and if you don't have time to set up any kind of shelter, you can still climb inside this and, uh, and be pretty uh, protected from the elements. As well, it adds extra warmth to your system. It's a semi-permeable one-way, you know, membrane. So that means that it's not gonna let moisture in, but it should let moisture out. Uh, that is gonna keep a lot of warmth inside of the bag just because of how that membrane works. So it's gonna add a couple of degrees to your, you know, your whole system. So first item, bivy sack, very important. Uh, next item, sleep pad. So we talked about this. This is something that uh, goes into that non-permissive environment as well. So it's something that stays with me no matter what environment I'm in. Whereas the, the bivy sack, we would probably not be using in a non-permissive environment, right? Because we don't want to get inside of it, but in a semi-permissive, we can get inside of a bag and, and still feel safe. So the sleep pad, again, used in conjunction with, uh, putting this on the ground in between your bivy and the, the earth is gonna protect that bivy sack. On the inverse, putting it inside of the bivy sack and having it closer to your body is going to keep it from getting saturated uh, in any way so I like to personally keep it inside, but you know, if you have a bad selection site, I'll definitely put it on the outside. Uh, if it is a foam pad, it's gonna be fine. If it is an inflatable pad, I will always try to put that inside of my bivy sack so that it doesn't get punctured. The venerable Wobie or poncho liner, I think that every, every soldier should have one of these and you definitely, uh, if you are living a nomadic lifestyle, you should consider upgrading to uh, you know, a better version. This one is from Kafaru. It has a Climashield monofilament synthetic fill on the inside, which means that it's continuous, right? So from edge to edge, no matter what direction, there's no quilting as you can see on this. So that means that you're not gonna get any cold spots. It's just a better product. It packs into its own stuff sack. I, you know, I've been using these. This is the second one that I've owned because the first one I've had for about a decade, uh, maybe even a little longer and still going strong. So yeah, the, the will be definitely a very important part. And then lastly, we have uh, the actual shelter itself, which is just a poncho. Uh, the poncho is the most carried item in my core kit. Uh, whereas all these items can be sacrificed because I'm on a patrol or something like that. But the poncho is something that always comes out uh, on patrol with me because it can be used in so many different capacities. It can be used for a shelter. It can be used just to wear as a poncho for rain gear. It can be used even as a litter in some cases or to cover uh, mission essential equipment or casualties or people that you're covering. It really, it's kind of the jack of all trades piece of equipment. Uh, it does have some flaws if you're using the U.S you know, GI army issued version. If you have the Marine Corps version, it's better in some ways, but it's a little heavier. So we'll talk about some of that stuff too. But you can see I have it pitched here uh, as a shelter, which we're gonna talk about that. So the poncho is a shelter. I think this is the, the most important lesson that you could, you could take away from this video with sleeping in a semi-permissive environment is that your poncho is a very versatile tool for getting great sleep out in any conditions. This can be used in cold weather conditions. This can be used in rainy conditions. Uh, it can be used in hot weather conditions where you need to just get out of the sun. Uh, so this tool has been used by many um, 
many, many soldiers over many, many years. And it is proven a proven technique that works really well. You can see that I have it just strung up right now in like this classic A-frame style. Uh, this is probably the most Boy Scout way that you can do this. You know, you have two trees, you have a bunch of stakes. I actually use stakes to set it up, which generally you probably wouldn't carry. Um, but you could carry if you knew that you were gonna be living in this environment or if you're heading to the range or something like that. The stakes provide obviously the best solution, but in Afghanistan, I just used rocks, right? I would just wrap 550 cord around rocks and just, you know, splay this thing out. Uh, another point that I would like to make is that, you know, this is an ideal and perfect setup, which you're rarely gonna actually have, right? We're sitting here, we're in the woods, there's a ton of trees everywhere. Not every guy is gonna be able to set his uh, shelter up in between two trees perfectly because that's just how things shake out and we're gonna have guys dispersed over a large area to keep them safe. So this is an ideal setup, but there's many ways that we can set this up. We can set it up as a lean-to. We can set it up as kind of a sawtooth uh, setup. We can, you know, the, the wings on it can be asymmetrical. You can have one that's higher than the other. Uh, depending on where the wind is, you might want to block one side more than the other. Uh, you might want to have a side open more so that you can get out of it a little quicker. This, this design right here is great for keeping you dry, but not great for getting in and out of in, in a hurry. So if you're somewhere where you can afford to be inside of it and, and not have to get out in a hurry, this is a great design. Uh, another point is that we can raise the same A-frame design up and that makes a great sun barrier. And then you have nice airflow going on underneath it. You can use the same technique if you are hanging a hammock underneath it. You can just have this higher up so it still protects you from the rain. So a lot of versatile options with the poncho itself. Some points that I'll make about how I have mine set up. One, you have to tie off the hood. So tying off the hood is not the easiest thing to do. It's gonna take some trial and error. If you tie this off too tightly, then your pitch is gonna be messed up. If you tie it too loosely, then you might have an annoying hole you know, in, in it that water is gonna get inside. And I'll tell you what, the fact that the new poncho has that weird neck pleat in it means that there's always gonna be a little bit of a hole. So just plan on there being a tiny bit of water coming in no matter what you do, which is why it's great to have your bivy sack on the inside as well. I also always keep 550 cord on each eyelet on the poncho. So there's six on the sides and then one on each center point here. I just keep a little girth hitch piece of about, you know, my arm's length on each one so that I can string it up to trees or tie it off or whatever, and I can quickly adjust it. I don't use any kind of hard knots to tie these, so I'll basically use some kind of prusik to be able to tighten and create tension on all of those lines. So it's important that you learn some knots if you're gonna be doing uh, this type of shelter. But yeah, that is the poncho, which is probably the most important piece of your you know, kind of four piece core kit that you should have as, a, as an infantryman. So you can see here that I'm sitting in a much higher pitched shelter than the, you know, the poncho tarp shelter that we showed you before. Some differences between the poncho shelter we showed you and this is that there's no hole because it's just a tarp. So it's not gonna leak on you in the same way that a poncho is. It actually is quite a bit longer, but a little bit more narrow than the poncho as well, as it is meant to be a shelter right out of the box and is not supposed to be a garment. We still have some of the same things. We have a bunch of guy lines that we've staked out using actual stakes, uh, but you can see there's one distinct difference. We use a trekking pole here to make a pitch for us. And in, what this has done is it's given us of uh, you know the ability to freestand the shelter and it's also given us the ability to create height uh, where we want height and why is this important well when you're refitting and you're working on things you're you want to be able to kind of you know actually sit up right so this is giving me the ability to sit up and uh, you know work on weapons maintenance work on my feet do whatever inside of the shelter it also being freestanding means that I can set it up pretty much anywhere as long as I can find the tools to stake it out and pitch it. Right now it's pretty high, obviously not gonna cut the wind from us, but it is gonna keep the sun off us 
and it is gonna keep the rain off of us. We could lower the back half if we wanted to, which is a very common way to sh set up a shelter like this, where we only have one trekking pole on this side. That trekking pole could be replaced with other things as well. It could be just replaced with a stick, or you could use a tripod. Say you're in a reconnaissance section, you can use your tripod to, to stake this up as well. It just makes it a little you know more cumbersome to get in and out of the shelter. I actually prefer a shelter like this, and if you're in any kind of mountain troop, uh, battalion or something like that, where you are doing a lot of alpine work and you're using trekking poles anyways, these shelters are a great option. You can stake them out with rocks that you can just find everywhere. And you can set up whole base camps just using a tarp, not having to have uh, in, you know, a freestanding tent or anything like that. So a very distinct advantage to the shelter is that the front is just open, right? So if you can imagine uh, you're on some kind of OP site and you're just tasked with you know, doing some kind of observation work, um, you can sit with the side of this open and you can take your camera or your spotting scope or whatever tools you have for observation and you can see an entire sector but still be protected from the elements and still be screened from above, right? This material, these, you know, these kinds of shelters are gonna be very hard to observe you on the inside of them. So not only a great place to just sleep at night, but a great place to, you know, just conduct daily activities as well. So something I really like about this kind of tarp or this tarp specifically is that with a couple of trekking poles and some guy lines, you can stake this thing out in a ton of different configurations and they can be, it can be completely freestanding. You don't need any trees or anything like that. You will need some way to stake the guy lines out, but that can just be, you know, big timber or it could be rocks or something like that. If I don't recommend carrying trekking poles just to pitch a shelter, but if you're already moving through the mountains and you're using them, or if maybe you're uh, ski troops, you already have them with you anyways. This is such a lightweight shelter. I think it's literally a pound and the protection that it offers and the versatility that it offers is just kind of unparalleled. So this type of shelter is a great tool if you are using uh, these freestanding poles. If you don't have them, you can still, you know, use guy lines to set this up uh, and stake it in the center, make it a little more taut. You can always improve this by adding additional guy lines to the side. We just put it in like kind of a basic configuration, but you could definitely beef this thing up to withstand wind. You can lower it down to keep, keep the weather off of you. So great tool for uh, freestanding situations. So this next shelter is something that's kind of unique and interesting. Uh, it's called a tripod TP. This one is specifically made by two vets tripods. And what you do is you essentially deploy your tripod and then you throw this TP over it and then you stake it down on around the perimeter. And now you have a little shelter, a little one man shelter that can be set up very, very fast. And I think that's the real advantage here is that you can set this thing up in like two minutes maybe maybe even less than that if you're if you're getting real good at it it's made out of a really burly you know material it is waterproof uh, it does come in in multicam as well this one's coyote brown uh, what i like about it is the speed to set up some limitations is the size right you're kind of constrained by the tripod but that is also an advantage to the system is that it's freestanding you don't need anything else to pitch it. You don't even need the stakes to pitch it. You can actually jam the tripod legs into these little pockets on the inside and the whole system can be freestanding. Although I think you're gonna have a better result with the stakes because it gives a little bit more room and it keeps it nice and taut. But yeah, a, a freestanding quick shelter, probably not gonna be for everyone. Again, I would not carry a tripod if you don't need a tripod. But again, if you are a recce troop or a mountain troop and you have tripods anyways, this might be a great way to uh, you know, get a product that your guys can deploy and use their already provided equipment to set this up. Uh, I am 5'8", and sitting inside here, my head is kind of touching the top, but I can still sit inside of it. Now, to be fair, the tripod I'm using is not a two vet tripod, uh, and theirs go much higher than this one. The legs are much longer and can be extended a little bit further. And because of that, I believe that the shelter would be taller, even for those six foot tall and and taller guys who want to 
sit in here as well. So, you know, again, the advantage to sitting is that I can actually like work on some stuff. Uh, I could also unzip this and observe through the zipper. So again, if you're in inclement weather at an OP site and you need somewhere to sit and just observe things, maybe through your spotting scope or your camera or, or even your rifle, you can be inside of here, but still using this, you know, this flap to observe outside and sit in a comfortable position instead of uh, having to be proned out the whole time you're in it, which, you know, the poncho shelter does not afford that level of comfort of being able to sit and kind of move around, change socks, things like that. So the tripod TB, another option, again, specialized, but uh, very fast to put up. So the next thing that we are going to talk about is this non-traditional kind of bivy sack. This is the Summit. We purchased this from a company called Canvas Cutter. So if you want to check it out, you can go look it up. I think they're actually in the process of updating this. So there might be a different model by the time you see this video. What I like about it, uh, as you can see, it is a pitched bivy, right? So it's freestanding. It doesn't require any stakes. It gives you a nice sheltered pitch without any you know any stakes or anything like that which is very good for somebody who is is nomadic and constantly moving around the big sell here is that you have a bug net and that's something that we haven't covered with any of the other shelters but i promise you it is a nightmare uh, if you get placed somewhere where the bugs are very bad all of those other shelters are going to be frustrating if you don't have a separate bug net to hang on the inside of them or something to put on yourself. This has it organically built into it, uh, much like the other bivy sack, which has that face net. Uh, the difference being that this will allow you to have massive airflow as well. So you can have this in a completely covered uh, one man tent mode with the, with the canvas pulled over the top, or you can have it in a one man bug net mode here, which is great. This is also another product that can be transitioned very well from the semi-permissive to the permissive environment as well, because there's no reason why you can't just use this as your bug net back at your fob or, or your main base of operation or something like that. The poles are removable. You don't have to use the poles with it. You don't even have to bring the poles with it. You can see that there's uh, some guy line points around. You could actually string this up to a tree if, the, if that's there, or if you're inside of a building, you can string it up uh, just using those guy lines. So you don't have to use the poles, although the poles are recommended if you wanna keep the netting off of your body and to, uh, to keep the bugs off you. I think this is great for anyone who is mounted. So like if you're a mounted troop and you're, you're spending a lot of time in vehicles, uh, this whole thing is actually what we would call a bedroll. So the intent is that you leave your sleep pad, your sleeping bag or your, your whoopee or whatever inside of it. And when you're done sleeping, you basically collapse the poles, take them out, put them back in the stowage bag, zip it shut, and then you roll the entire thing up and then you put it somewhere and then you move on to the next spot. And then when you get there, you just unroll it and your whole sleep system is already ready to go, which is great. You know, if you didn't get wet, if there's no reason why you can't just roll your stuff up and move, very, very easy to use, very compact and very simple, especially if you're stopping every night to sleep, it just makes setup just so much easier than if you're trying to pitch something in that mobility setting. Now, it is a little heavier when you consider having all of your stuff packed together and then rolled up. It's kind of cumbersome. So it's not going to work as well in that configuration for, uh, let's say just an infantry guy who's rucking with all this stuff on his back, but it is just a bivy sack would be something that I could still use. And even without the poles, you still have the ability to just at least have a bug net over your body to keep most of the insects out of your stuff. I like that when it's set up like it is right now, when I wake up in the morning, I can get out of it and then I can seal the whole system. Let's say that I'm going to leave it here, but go away for a while. I can seal everything up to make sure that nothing is getting in my sleep gear and I, I don't have to tear it all down every time uh, that I get up. So again, the Summit by Canvas Cutter, very cool little system. It is technically a bed roll, but you know, what is a bed roll? It's kind of a bivy sack with, with some features. So you can get it uh, with this pole configuration. Uh, and I forgot to mention, you can also get it with just a face pole configuration. So if you don't want the pole that goes all the way down, you can get one that just props up much smaller and lighter. So you can have that one as well. So one 
serious disadvantage to all of the bivy sack or bed rolls or anything like that is that uh, you can't put your equipment inside the uh, shelter with you. You know, another disadvantage is that because you are zipped inside of something, you always run the risk of just not being able to get out of it as quickly. But because we're in that semi-permissive environment, we're not as concerned with that. So another point that I wanna bring up is for the old dog or the old breed specifically. I know that a lot of the things that we're showing in this video, even though it is framed around a semi-permissive environment, is probably making you a little uneasy because you're just so used to not having any sort of deployed shelter uh, out in the field or in any real conditions at all. And I understand why that is. This is a slippery slope. If you all of a sudden are setting up, you know, big Coleman camping tents out in the middle of the field. That's the kind of stuff that uh, gets guys killed for sure. And that is not our intent, right? You have to know the application for, you know, whatever shelter type that you're going to use. And you have to, you know, be very honest with yourself and recognize that when it's time to be uncomfortable and when it's time to be comfortable. So with that being said, there's a drone in the room that we need to talk about. These are prolific now. They're on the battlefield, they're everywhere. They're flying around, right? The way you implement a shelter can make or break this technology. So this thing is looking at you with optical sensors that uh, one is just in you know the, the visible light spectrum, but also in the IR spectrum, the thermal spectrum. You have to be able to hide from those threats. Anything that is draped over your body that is touching your body is gonna translate that heat to it. And that is gonna create a thermal signature on your body. So things like the bivy sack, which has been a staple of the military, sleeping in that bivy sack is going to get very warm. If you look at a field full of guys in, in bivy sacks, you're gonna see a bunch of little hot signatures on the ground. Now, if you create some standoff using something like the shelter here, then that warm you know, body is, is concealed behind something that has an equal temperature as the ground. So it's definitely a developing TTP, but it is something to consider when you are testing your, uh, you know, your SOPs out in the field. String some of these up. You guys have the thermals, things like that. Take a look at them, see what they look like. Uh, there's also other things out there. There are thermal defeat materials. This one's from Relv Camo. Uh, it's called a hide. So there's things like this that can really help. Uh, you can put these over shelters, things like that. String these up to defeat thermal and IR signature stuff. Something to consider when you're using these kinds of shelters. All right, so we kind of talked about all these different systems, but I wanted to show uh, the systems kind of packed up and some of the some of the pieces that you might need for setting them up successfully. And just to give you a size comparison between the different systems and, and just to compare some of the pros and cons between them as well. So on the far right here, we have the Summit. Uh, this was that, you know, freestanding bedroll with the mosquito net on it. And as you can see, uh, I have it rolled up in a true bedroll fashion, right? And this has my sleep pad and my Wubby, the poles, everything inside of it rolled up. So you can imagine uh, this would be, you know, on the outside of your ruck or more preferably, this would just be thrown in a vehicle if you have uh, a vehicle to travel around in. So again, I think it's a great, uh, value if you are using this in that capacity, right? You're pulling this off your truck, throwing it out real quick, so fast to deploy, and it has that built-in uh, bug screen. You know, the real advantage there is, again, that quickness to deploy it. Everything's already inside. Just roll it out, climb inside, and get some sleep. Here we have the Marine Corps uh, bivy sack, and, you know, to do it justice, I really have to compress it. But to just give you an idea, right, it's about the size of like your average rain jacket or something like that. So again, this could easily fit in the center pocket on an Alice pack. Um, does not take up much room, a lot of value there. Waterproof, uh, again, the disadvantage, you're getting inside of something. It's only the bivy sack itself. There's no, uh, you know, other properties to it. That one does have the bug screen though, which is really nice. Uh, this was that Kafaru uh, little tarp. So you can see that this is actually very, very small, very lightweight, and you could even compress it more. I mean, that's pretty amazing how small that gets. Uh, this doesn't have any 
any of the stakes with it. And if you really want to get the full value out of it, in my opinion, you have to have either a place that you can guy it out. So the terrain would dictate that, or you have to carry some other way to suspend this, right? So trek poles, something like that. This is the, the GI poncho, US government issued. Again, has the same problems that the Kafaru has. When we look at the size, very comparable in size to the Kafaru. Uh, not as large of a footprint and not as easy to guy out and it doesn't have reinforced you know points for something like these trek poles here to in order to mount them but it is also a rain garment so it does have that advantage to it and you probably already get issued this so this may be the right answer for you a little more versatility in the kafaru uh, as far as pitching it but still a, still a very good option and still my preferred option for my kit personally i also put out some stakes just to kind of show you some of the market options out there. Stakes are not something that traditionally I would have uh, thought I would carry, but these guys right here, these little groundhog stakes, and I think they even make a size that's smaller than this from MSR, are very, very lightweight, and you don't need a lot of them to successfully pitch something. So again, if you are in some kind of specialized situation where having a shelter is necessary, uh, you know, cold weather conditions, mountain warfare, things like that, you might consider having a stake if you're in the right environment. Otherwise, you're going to be guying things out to rocks. You can tell this is an old aluminum stake, how much you know smaller this one is to it. Now, I will say this, having a good set of stakes, they're cheap. You can pretty much buy them anywhere. These are great for just you know those range ops. You're getting sent out to do a marksmanship range or something, but you still have to live out of your poncho or something like that. It just makes it easier to, to pitch things up. So this guy is the, the teepee, right? That tripod teepee. Uh, and this is a very burly material, so it does not compress down uh, very much. That's about as small as I can get it. Uh, so maybe if you put it in a compression sack, it would work a little bit better. I think the multicam version does come in a lighter weight material. So there is that just to be fair to it. But you also, need to carry something like this, right? So if you already have it, that's great. If you already have a tripod, uh, that's a, a very cool system. Again, the advantage being that you can very quickly deploy it. You can sit up in it and you can uh, you can observe out of, out of that front zipper uh, doorway there. So one item that we didn't show, or and we're, but it's worth mentioning, it's a notable mention, is the venerable hammock. Uh, the reason why we didn't string one up is because it's a hammock and it is very, very specialized. There's only certain times that uh, you ever really want to use a hammock. Uh, and, the, and mainly those are in tropical environments. So anywhere where you're going to have to get up off the ground or A, you're going to get eaten alive or B, you're going to get flooded, then the only option is to have a hammock. Everybody's probably seen a hammock. Most people have probably laid in a hammock. Uh, some people love hammocks and some people hate hammocks but either way uh, they do have a place in this type of environment if there is no other option if there is another option it would not be my first choice mainly because i can't fit any of my kit in it i have to carry a separate uh, tarp to cover it anyways uh, and you're also inside of something suspended off the ground which makes you a prime target for gunfire and artillery, which again, in a semi-permissive environment is possible. It's possible that we're going to see those things. I will say that having a hammock in your kit as part of your deployment kit can be a great idea for just, again, being that nomad, right? If you are flying on a, on a cargo aircraft or something like that, you can always use your hammock on on those as well, which is, which is great. But in this environment, I think that they're worth mentioning, but not, would not be, my first, second, or even third choice. So guys, that's it. Semi-permissive environments. We talked about a lot of different systems and a lot of different ways to implement them. Uh, really, it's up to you to kind of figure out your needs uh, and just, you know, look at some of the options that are out there and see what works for you. You know, keep in mind, it might be a combination of a couple of different systems that get you that kind of perfect sweet spot for your specific use case or conditions. So that's it, guys. Make sure you like and subscribe to the channel. Again, it helps us out tremendously. It helps keep us making content like this. I appreciate your time as always, and we'll see you in the next video.